compressed air is fast and short cycle times can be achieved in automated assembly applications. At the same time, it is overload safe. If a system jams, pneumatics actuators will not burn out. Compressed air is also safe. It does not explode in a wide range of operating temperatures. In a hazardous environment where you cannot use electric actuators, pneumatics is a good option. Pneumatic actuators can grip, push, and move. They can also perform linear or rotational movements at high speed. That's why pneumatics became one of the most widely used technologies in automation. Here you see a simple pneumatic system with the most common elements used. So let's start at the beginning with the compressor and follow the process up until the cylinder is set into motion. The compressor generates energy in the form of compressed air. Here the so-called displacement compressors are used. These draw air from the surrounding area and compress it to a smaller volume to get the desired pressure. How a piston compressor works was already explained in another video. Please watch our playlist if you need further information. Atmospheric pressure is the ambient pressure of the surrounding air. The problem is that atmospheric pressure varies with temperature and altitude. So we define the standard atmospheric pressure as the average pressure at sea level at the temperature of 273 Kelvin or 0 degrees Celsius. This absolute pressure is referred against a perfect vacuum. By the way, we have an absolute vacuum in space. The gauge pressure, on the other hand, is referenced against ambient air pressure. As the name suggests, it is the pressure valve that you read on the pressure gauge, also called a manometer. For example, our compressor delivers a pressure of 7 bar, which is what we read out at the pressure gauge. So actually, we have an absolute pressure value of about 8 bar. Pressure is built up when air is compressed to a smaller volume. Hereby, the volume multiplied with the pressure equals a constant value. This relationship can be described by the following formula, also referred as the combined gas law. This law is a combination of three gas laws, which are Boyle's law, Charles' law, and Gay-Lussac's law. Let's assume a compressor with an output of 8 to 1. With this formula, we can determine the output pressure as follows. Note that we must first subtract the ambient pressure from the absolute pressure to get the actual gauge pressure. Once the air is compressed, it must be dried and cleaned of moisture and dirt to ensure reliable operations. Dirt can clog up the moving parts of the system, and water can cause corrosion of valves and fittings. That's where FRL comes in. FRL stands for filter, regulator, and lubricator. Let's identify each unit. Air enters the air filter through angled louvers. This causes the air to spin as it enters the bowl. Due to the centrifugal force of the rotating air, the larger particles of dirt, rust, and water are thrown against the inner wall of the filter bowl. These contaminants then flow down to the bottom of the filter bowl where you can leave them. The separator disc divides the filter into a zone with air circulating and a slowdown zone. This way the condensate cannot be picked up by the airflow again. It is essential to supply the air at a constant pressure, regardless of upstream flow and pressure fluctuations. Pressure regulators, also referred to as pressure reducing valves or PRVs, ensure the consistency of the dynamic working pressure at a specific value. 
There are several types of air regulators. The diaphragm type regulator is commonly used in industrial pneumatic systems, so we'll take it as an example. As the name suggests, the pressure is regulated by the movement of the diaphragm, but how so? Whenever the more greatly compressed air is consumed, then the pressure might drop on the load side. Therefore, the force acting on the diaphragm decreases. Due to the spring force, the diaphragm is pushed together with the valve disc in such a way, permitting more airflow to the secondary side and increasing the pressure again. If the outlet pressure is too high due to less consumption, then the load pressure increases. Therefore, the force acting on the diaphragm increases, the valve disc closes, less air flows, and the output pressure must decrease. To enhance the maximum level of performance and diminish the wear of the actuators, the lubricator adds controlled quantities of oil into the system. The lubricator works on the Venturi principle. As high-velocity air passes through a Venturi system, it draws the oil up and through a capillary, then drips it into the airstream. The moving air breaks up the oil into a mist. Note that in some industries, like the food industry, you cannot use lubricators, but because of the smaller tolerances of pneumatic components, using pipes of plastic and not metal pipes, for example, a lubricator might be unnecessary in your application. Once the compressed air has been prepared, it can be used for the pneumatic circuit. Our plant here has a two-hand lock with two pneumatic buttons as input elements. Basically, there are three by two valves, spring return and manually actuated. The two-hand locking is a safety device to protect an operator from injury. Here, the cylinder can only extend if both buttons are pressed simultaneously. This means that the signals from the two push buttons must be linked by a so-called logic and valve, also called a two-pressure valve. Let's take a closer look at the function of the dual pressure valve. As the name suggests, you get the operating pressure at the output of this dual pressure valve only when both inputs are supplied with pressure. But how so? With different input pressures, the side with the highest pressure closes the valve, and the side with the lowest pressure is directed to the output. This switching also stays in place when both the inputs have the same high pressure. It is a common misconception that the shift piston must be in the center position for the two-pressure valve to connect through. This is exactly what would be an undefined switching position. At this point, we should also mention the logic OR valve, also called a shuttle valve. As the name suggests, the operating pressure is switched through as soon as one of the inputs is applied to the pressure. If both inputs are pressurized, the signal that arrives first stays switched through the output. Back to our circuit, the signal from our logic valve leads to the control input of our indirect acting directional control valves. Indirect acting operated valves use the pressure force to open and close the valve seat. The resulting indirect control system has several advantages. As you've seen, logic functions can be built, even more complex than in our example. This makes automation possible. It permits the remote actuation of large valves with inexpensive pilot lines. The more expensive working lines of the larger directional control valves can then be kept short to save money. Short reaction times can be achieved as the delays caused by the compressibility of the air can be reduced by using tubes with smaller diameters. Moreover, our directional control valve can be classified as a 5 by 2 valve, which means 5 connections and 2 switching positions. As we have a double acting cylinder, this valve has 2 outlet ports to the cylinder. If a rotational cylinder or pneumatic motor is used, or just for safety reasons, it might be necessary that the actor is fixed in its actual position, in case that the directional control valve gets no input signal. 
Here, control valves with three switching positions is the right choice. Spring-loaded on both sides keeps the valve in its central position if no input signal is coming in, and so the air is stuck within the lines between the valve and the actuator. The so-called throttled valve serves to reduce the velocity of our cylinder. Because in our circuit, the velocity is only reduced during extension, a shutoff valve is integrated within the case. The origins of pneumatics can be traced back to the first century when a Greek mathematician and inventor simply known as the Hero of Alexandria created what we can call the first pneumatic tools. Despite their rudimentary design, many of these tools laid the foundation for further pneumatics as we know them today. From this time, pneumatics got its name. The term pneumatics is derived from the ancient Greek word pneuma and means something like breath or wind, so pneumatics can be seen as a branch of engineering that makes use of gas or pressurized air. It took several centuries for significant discoveries to be made in pneumatics. One of the first who could be called a modern scientist was the German Otto von Guericke. In 1650, he invented the first air pump capable of producing a partial vacuum. The 1800s proved to be an essential century in the development of pneumatics, as many more became aware of how pneumatic tools can be used in the factory and more. Here are some developments from that time. It was 1829 when William Mann invented the first stage or compound air compressor. A compound air compressor compresses air in successive cylinders. By 1872, compressor efficiency was improved by having the cylinders cooled by water jets, which led to the invention of water-jacketed cylinders. The greatly improved efficiency of air compressors laid the foundation for the industrial appliance of pneumatic tools. The pneumatic components of our circuit can be grouped according to their function as shown here. We recognize the structure of the pneumatic circuit as we can differentiate between different levels. Let's start with the energy source and its preparation. These components form the first level. The second level includes input elements. These can be push bottoms, like in our examples, but also pneumatic sensors. Logic functions are located in the third level. The fourth level contains valves, which control the actuator in direction and speed. At last, the fifth level, which includes the actuator. Here, you get the associated circuit diagram with its different levels. Note that the energy flow in the pneumatic circuit diagram runs from bottom to top, starting with the compressor and FRL unit and ending at the actuator. But note, Within simple circuits, a pneumatic component may provide the function of multiple levels. Here, this manually operated 5x2 valve acts as an input element and final control element at the same time. We are going back to the history of pneumatics to get the bridge to the present. As mentioned before, several inventions in pneumatics took place in the 18th century like the pneumatic drill, invented in 1871 by Samuel Ingersoll. The pneumatic-powered hammer followed later in 1890, invented by Charles Brady. It was 1893 when the first pneumatic mail system was installed in Philadelphia. Four years later, New York City got its own. The tube transported letters at about 30 miles per hour using compressed air. Pneumatic tube transport, or PTT, gained acceptance in the 19th century within buildings and relatively small distances. Even today, this means of transport still remains, for example, in hospitals, and it's still developed. Towards the end of the 1960s, the first digitally controlled pneumatic components began to enter the market, playing a big role in the field of automation. This was also about the time when the Programmable Logic Controller, or PLC, arrived on the market. Nowadays, electronics and pneumatics grow together more and more, building one unit. An electro-pneumatic circuit is characterized by the fact that this circuit has an electrical control circuit. 
we want to transform our purely pneumatic circuit into an electro-pneumatic circuit. To do this, we first replace the directional control valve with an electrically operated directional control valve. In the control circuit, we now have two electrical buttons, which implement the AND function through a series connection. And it's working. What you can see is that the pneumatic load circuit has not been changed. We still use the same cylinder controlled by 5x2 directional control valve, and we keep the flow control valve to reduce the extension speed. Only our DCV is now controlled electrically. Let's have inside of this valve. The moving part is commonly referred to as a spool. Here, the solenoid causes the spool to move within the housing against the spring force as soon as it is energized. As soon as the solenoid is no longer energized, the spool retracts to its initial position due to the spring force. Regarding the circuit, in electro-pneumatics, a distinction is made between the electric circuit and the pneumatic load circuit. The input signals are processed within the electrical control circuit. Input elements are usually electrical contacts, like buttons and switches or electronic sensors. The control voltage is usually 24-volt direct current. Here, the link between the electric circuit and the pneumatic circuit is, as you see, the solenoid labeled as 1M1. But this relay control is also very limited in its possibilities. The next step to meet the requirements of today's automation would be to replace this relay control with a PLC. PLC stands for Programmable Logic Control. With a PLC, you have a wide range of options. You can now control analog directional control valves, create control loops, and enable data exchange with other stations or master computers. But more about this in another video on our channel. More information about pneumatics and electro pneumatics you get in our webpage. If you want to be updated about new videos, please subscribe to our channel.